Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. How y'all doing this morning? Everything went all right. Um, it's certainly wonderful to be with you. Um, I was actually here about a month ago. It was the first Sunday in June because I got to celebrate communion with you. I just dropped in for a visit and uh, enjoyed Jason's message that Sunday. Uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful to be here, but I hate the reason why we have to be here. Uh, as I told Jason earlier, he's certainly not the first pastor uh, to be sick or injured, and uh, we uh, deal with these things the, the best way we can. But Elmer, you're right, or Albert, you're right. Um, <laughs> pray for Jenny. <laughs> so if y'all were on there, hi. Yeah, that was for you. <laughs> but uh, um, but I just want to, anytime I'm here, just thank you all for, uh, on behalf of the West Virginia Baptist Convention for your, your work, your support, um, everything that you all do uh, as we do our mission of doing Christ's work together. And it's what we do as nearly 400 churches across the state. Uh, as we come together to do what we can't do apart. And that's always a blessing to understand um, how little things just go a long, long way. Uh, just as your church has been very different this year, so has our ministries. Um, it's kind of weird for us not to have camp at Cowan, and, and that brings a lot of issues with it, financial, and, and just not, you know, the biggest thing, not being able to minister to about 2,000 kids in person uh, is huge. Um, BCM, still, Rob's still trying to figure out how that's going to look um, coming up at Marshall. They usually pack about 300 kids into a space much smaller than this, <laughs> and um, I don't think they're going to be able to do that this year. So, yeah, we're in a time uh, that the church is not, we're having to learn how to do something that we're not used to and as a church, and that's to be flexible. Because has anybody here ever known the church to be flexible? <laughs> no, because if we change one thing, somebody gets mad, Right. Uh, if we think about changing one thing, somebody gets mad. Uh, wow, we're just made up of a bunch of people. And <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so, so thank you all for that. Your song couldn't have been more perfect, really, to go along with this message. Um, and and it's, it, it's amazing to know that, that our cries, God hears them. And, and sometimes we, we feel like maybe he's asleep and not hearing us and, and not you know, comprehending what we're going through. Uh, but yet he's there the whole time. And um, no matter what we're going through, does not worry God. And, and that is a, an amazing thing to know. I probably should have said before, if you have your Bibles, turn to, we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 1. <clears throat> um, back in the Old Testament there before uh, Ezra, or right past Ezra. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But Because uh, really, uh, the, the thought behind the message... Um, preparing to serve, but yet also serving God when things are difficult, serving God in chaos. Because if, if we know anything right now, we, we're living in a bit of chaos. As things change from day to day, uh, as we have to adapt from day to day, uh, I was talking with a pastor at a church in Charleston. They were outside for a while, then they moved back in the sanctuary. Actually, today through the end of August, they're going to be back out uh, in their parking lot just trying to figure out as you know, in the Charleston area as the, the COVID numbers kind of explode and blow up. Um, and so, you know, let's not take for granted being able to be in this building today because, and being able to be inside. On the other hand, um, let's not fret if we can't actually worship inside because... The biblical model, I mean, what we, if we turn to Matthew chapter 5, it's the sermon. It's not the sermon in the sanctuary, is it? It's the sermon on the mount. I mean, outdoor services are okay. And we, we, we feel like, and we do feel like we lose something when we can't worship inside together. But the thing is, that doesn't tell us who we are. If, if we're not able to be inside, if we have to do things a little differently, that's okay. God's still God. Christ is still on the throne, and that's who we serve. And so we have to be flexible, 
but to say, you know what, if something changes, it doesn't change our relationship with Christ. It, it doesn't change, really it shouldn't change anything other than where we choose to worship at, even if that's online. Uh, we're still the church. We're still the bride of Christ, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, um, but, but I think as we're going through this, and, and this is speaking in general terms, but I feel like this really applies to where we are at now. Um, I think a lot of us have found ourselves in a situation where we feel like God may be calling us to step out and do something different, try something new. And sometimes we, we, we even experience this as a church, where, where God's calling us as a church to step out and do something new, to do something a little bit different. Because if we keep doing things the same way, we're going to become very ineffective very quickly. Um, but yet we feel like God's calling us out sometimes, and yet we just feel like our life's in a mess. Have you ever felt like your life's in a mess, or is it just me? <clears throat> like daily, right? I mean, I can figure out something daily that, that is just a mess and something that's going on. And so then we get caught into this trap of God saying, go and do. And I'm like, God, I, I'm not in the right place. I, I'm, not, I'm not spiritually where I need to be with you. And then he's like, well, whose fault's that? <laughs> yeah, it's me. Um, and we can become that way very much as a church to say, you know, we, we want to move forward. We want to do different ministries, but yet maybe we're not healthy enough. Maybe there's a roadblock. Maybe there's something standing in the way. And I'm afraid it, we can allow a COVID situation that, that is serious and we have to take it serious. But I'm afraid we can allow a situation like that to also become an excuse of why we're not doing ministry. See, we didn't stop being the church, did we? Things have changed. But God's calling us to look forward. You have two cameras sitting back here, and I know you all have done some digital before, but these are going to be how we do church a lot. And these are going to be, hopefully, how we reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we are not taking advantage of every, absolutely every opportunity to reach people with the gospel of Christ, no matter how inconvenient it is, no matter how hard it is, then we are in the wrong, right? Because God's calling us to reach a lost and dying world with his good news, with the gospel. Because that is exactly why Jesus died. About 2,600 years ago, in a land far, far away, actually Jerusalem. Any Star Wars fans? Y'all got that, right? So about 2,600 years ago, Jerusalem, God's people were taken into exile Taken from the land, Jerusalem was pretty well tore down and destroyed. The walls were tore down. The temple was tore down. The people were taken out of their home to another land far, far away. They were in a mess. Would you, would you call that a mess? I would call that a little bit worse than what we're experiencing now. My house hasn't been tore down. I might have had to stay inside it for a while. Oh, the, the inconveniences of sitting on a couch eating too much food, right? We're overly blessed, aren't we? But they were in a mess, and yet we are given so many stories of perseverance through the mess that we read in Scripture. The book before Nehemiah, as mentioned before, is Ezra. There were, we learn after 70, 70, after 70 years of them being in exile, wrap that around your mind, they were basically in bondage for 70 years. There was a group of about 50,000 Israelites that were then allowed to go back to Jerusalem to start rebuilding the temple. Of course, that didn't happen very quickly, right? Uh, Zerubbabel led the first return to Jerusalem, and that was about 538 years before Jesus was born. So, you know, pretty big time gap that we're dealing with. And then about 80 years after that, 458 B.C., Ezra led the second return to get the temple finished. So, you know, this is happening in stages. And so about 93 years later, we catch up to where we are today. So about 93 years after, this, after the, the Israelites have been taken into exile, we kind of catch up to where we are today. And, and I'm going to read Nehemiah 1 through 11, which is all the whole first chapter. Not very long, but, but bear with us. In the first month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. 
And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the, the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mounted and fasted, or I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer that your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to a place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by great strength in your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant. And to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear God, we are thankful and blessed to be here this morning to gather in your name to worship you. God, not for ourselves, but, but to, for you to... Be a blessing to you because you bless us so much. God, to, to sing words of praise to you. And God, as we dive into your word here, I, I just pray, Lord, if we need our toes stomped on, to stomp hard. If we need encourage today, God, to, to encourage us. If we need to move forward towards you and towards your plan in our lives, God, that you would give us the courage to move forward. And God, I pray that you do all this and just shut my mouth and speak the words that you want to say through me. God, so that you can speak to each and every one of our hearts as we prepare our hearts and, and our minds and our bodies for to celebrate communion this morning. God, thank you for the blessings that you shower down upon us. For it's these things we pray in Jesus' name and amen. So he's in exile. I mean, we read through this whole, a lot of words there, but we, but we agree they were in a mess. I think we already did that. I mean, it's a, I can't comprehend what a mess that they were truly in. I can't comprehend being taken, you know, somebody comes in and takes us all to Canada or Mexico or, or, or wherever and then tears down we're gone for a while. Imagine we come back and St. Albans and Charleston and it's just wiped out. We, we can't comprehend that really. Of course, we also couldn't comprehend March the 1st, <laughs> what we would experience March the 15th and beyond, could we? It was incomprehensible to me that my children wouldn't be able to go to school anymore. <laughs> It's incomprehensible to me that here coming up September 8th, we're not still totally sure that they're going to go back to school and, and what that's going to look like and what things are going to look like for the church. But, but I do know that this is a small, <laughs> it's nothing for God, right? God is in control. See, when we find ourselves and we find our lives in a mess and we we have a couple difference in how we respond, and probably all of us can, can understand this, because the first way we can respond is we can complain and pout, right? I'm great at that. I think we all have a gift for complaining and pouting, right? I mean, get on Facebook, you see that a lot. You get on the news, you see that a lot. Get on, talk to people, you see this a lot. Instead of moving forward, we just want to complain about things, we want to pout about things, and, and you know, a lot of this comes in with gossip and we want to talk about people and put other people down. 
because that's what we do. Number two, though, so we can complain about, or we can give it to God and follow him. Now, now which, which one do you think he would have us to do? I'm going to go with option number two, although I always, for some reason, in our, we're good at it in our humanity to revert back to number one because we want what we want, right? And sometimes when we follow number two and given our lives and given our things to God and following him, well, it makes us uncomfortable and, and it makes us go out there and step out in faith into something that's unknown that we don't understand that might scare us. That, that might push our, our boundaries, that, that might threaten us even because of that change in our lives or that change in our world. So number one with, with this message in you know, following God in uncertain times is number one, give your mess to God. I think that's a great place to start. Nehemiah heard the report of what was happening and the walls had fallen down. So here we are almost 100 years later and things are really not getting any better in Jerusalem. So he said, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. Nehemiah heard the news. He was heartbroken. He wept, which is okay. We grieve things, right? He wept and then he gave it to God. And I think when we go through things, when we go through chains, it's okay to grieve those things. Because, hey, let's face it, that's part of the process, is grieving things that we will no longer do. I, I look back, <laughs> I, you so often and see something every day on TV or watching a show. It's like, hey, remember when we used to do that back in February? <laughs> we were watching a show last night, and it was somebody's birthday. <sighs> they blew on the cake, and number one, you realize, man, that is pretty gross. And, and number two... We can't do, we'll probably never be able to blow on a cake again. Here's, a, here's your cupcake, blow out your candle, right? I mean, things have changed, and we'll have to grieve these things, and handshakes. I mean, really, we see it's kind of biblical, the right hand of brotherhood, but it's really the best way to pass germs that we, we have in existence. Um, I, I went to the doctor before any of this and got my flu shot this year. And, and he knows what I do, and I travel around and, and go to different churches. And he said, you're Baptist, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I'm Methodist. He said, but you all give us a lot more business than the Methodist church does because you all shake hands a lot more than we do. That was just from my doctor. I, I don't know. But, you know, we, we go through things and... and it's, those are small life changes, wearing a mask. I hate these stupid things, don't you? But, but if I, you know, people, we can get into the political realm of it, but I think bottom line, if, if I have 0.001% of a chance of not making somebody else sick, I'm going to do it. You know, we'll leave that there. <laughs> we, we can get deep into that, but let's get back into God's word. <laughs> he heard this news. He was heartbroken. He gave it to God. And I love in verse 5, he puts things into perspective. Where, where I mean, he prays, but then he starts praying in verse 4, and he said, and I love this, he remembers who God is. Lord, the God of heaven, still on the throne, right? The great and awesome God, and I think God is great and God is awesome. He's the creator of the world. He, he understands our messes better than we even do. <sighs> Keep things into perspective. And he says, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Do you love Jesus? Maybe I've asked you all this before. That, that's one of my favorite questions to ask a church. Do you love Jesus? Because if you can't say yes to that, you're, you're at the wrong starting line. If we can't say, yes, I love Jesus and I give my life to him, then anything we do is very self-serving for ourselves. But when we love Jesus, we can step out of ourselves, we can trust him, and we can do what God's calling us to do. And, and Nehemiah is, is remembering who God is. He loves him, and, and he's doing his best to keep his commandments. And let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. God, please hear my prayer because our prayers awaken the master, right? Our prayers do, do great things, not because anything powerful in us, but because of who we're praying to. Not because we are so good, but because Jesus Christ is. 
He kept his perspective. And then we see at the end of verse 6 that he confessed his sins to God. And, and, and I'm one to say, I think when we accept Christ, the day I accepted Jesus Christ, my sins were forgiven, past, present, and future. But I still need to come to God and admit my faults to Him. And I still need to come before the throne of God and pray to Him to, to, to recognize that I'm still messed up, right? I'm saved by grace, and, and I'll tell anybody, I should have been dead in a ditch a long time ago of the stupid things I've done. But I'm a child of the King. And we love Jesus Christ, and we accept Him into our lives. We're, we're children of the King. And, and we still need, when, when a mess up, come to, to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Not because I have to beg him for my forgiveness to be forgiven again and saved again and all this stuff, but to acknowledge that I'm still a sinner saved by grace. He lifted up the prayers for himself. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself, my father's family, have committed against you. That's a tough one. And then we have to be a willing to allow God to change us. That's the hard part, isn't it? He says in verse 7, We've acted very wickedly toward you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and the laws that you gave to your servant Moses. See, it's easy for God, and you've heard this probably before, it's very easy for God to change the circumstances that we're in. It's easy for us to say, God, remove the hurdle. God, remove the stumbling block. God, remove this situation. It's a whole lot harder to say, God, change me through this situation into who you want me to be. Because that's more the business God is in. Will he remove bad circumstances? Yes. But our thought and our goal as followers of Jesus Christ should be to become more like Christ and to pray, God, change me into who you want me to be through this situation. I think it's okay to mourn the situation and say, I hate it. This is horrible. But God, use this. Use this circumstance to make me who you want me to be. Number two, return your life to God. Verse 8, he says, remember the instruction that you gave your servant Moses. See, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. And I wonder if we're unfaithful as a church. Will God bless that? I, I, I wonder about that. And I don't have the, the definitive answer, but I got to think, if we're unfaithful as a church, if we're not obedient to following where God wants us to go personally or as a church, is he going to bless that? I have to say no. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but we have to be willing to go where God wants us to be. He's saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people are at the farthest horizon. Maybe God's trying to use this situation to get the church. I mean, I'd say... It's very easy to become self-centered, but to say, you know what? It's not about us. It's about you, God, and it's about reaching this lost world with your gospel no matter what and however we can do that. Is that convenient? Is that easy? It's not. You didn't sign up for anything easy. See, the moment you gave your life to Christ, scripturally speaking, you died to yourself and gave your life to him. A lot of people that scares, and I think it sounds scary, but when we realize that when we give our lives to Christ and we live through him, he lives through us. Wow. It's the best life ever. Doesn't mean it's easy. How many times do we hear people saying something like this? I need to straighten out my life and then get back in church. Have you ever heard that? Or we are good to say, well, you need to get straightened up and then come to church with me sometime. And that's the exact opposite of what it should be. This is the place that we come to, to give our lives to God, to, to worship the God of God. We don't come here to serve because we've got it all figured out. We come here to worship him because we know we don't. And he loves us anyway. 
it, the old saying, well, and Jesus said this, it's not the healthy that need a physician, but the sick. Are you sick? I am. <laughs> Saved by grace, but yet it's in that battle. It's in that soul sickness. And, and you go back to the saying, I forget, it's been, I think, given to different people as, as quoting this, but it says, this place is not a hotel for the saints, but a hospital for sinners. Aren't you glad you came? Number three is serve God where you are. We might be stuck in the house. Might not be able to get out. I remember one particular lady when I pastored at Barbersville Baptist. She was a prayer warrior. She was in a nursing home and couldn't leave. But she took advantage of that and she prayed. And I knew she prayed because the day that she died, there was something different. Because she said, I pray for you every day. And I said, I know you do, because I can tell. And she prayed, and, and that's, that's what she did with her time. She had a list of people she'd go down, and she would pray for. And sometimes we're going to be stuck in our house. Sometimes we're not going to be able to get out and do the things that we want to do. Verse 10, he says, They are your servants and your people. Whom you redeemed. See, the thing is, here was an Israelite taken into exile, but was in really a position of power as a cup bearer to the king. And he went and he pleaded to the king. See, we're all here to serve God, not the other way around. We're all here. We should be praying, Lord, hear our prayer. Grant us favor as Nehemiah did. As the cupbearer, he used his position to serve God. Remember Esther? Queen Esther used her position to serve God. See, we need to use our present position to serve God where we are and not wait till conditions get better. He prayed for success, not just that God would remove the situation. And he didn't pray for personal success. He requested success for God's work. And this is a choice. See, when we give our mess to God, we have to admit that we have a mess and that we need saved from our mess. When we return our life to God, we do this by believing God's Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and Lord, and that He is the only way. Jesus said He is the truth, the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. And His words were that no one can come to the Father except through me, and then serve God where you are. Because we have to choose to follow Jesus and choose to serve Him where we are. We are going to have a song of invitation after I pray. And... We're going to prepare our hearts at this time for communion. So after we pray and the psalm plays, I just pray if there's anything in your heart or in your life that you need to deal with at this time before coming to the Lord's table. Deal with that now. Eternal God, my prayer for us today reflects that of Nehemiah. God, help us to turn to you. God, help us to live for you. And God, help us to choose to serve you. Give us success today, Lord, in serving you in the midst of our own little worlds, in the midst of our own little pandemics, even if we found ourse find ourselves quarantined or, or whatever. God, help us to be your willing servants. Help us, God, to be world changers today. And as we move forward, when I just lift up Pastor Jason, I lift up the leadership of this church. God, I lift up the members of this church that we all work to be the ministers and the missionaries, God, that you have called us to be right here in St. Albans, West Virginia. 
God, help us to listen to your words. Help us to search ourselves through these couple minutes before we come to your table. Because your word says in 1 Corinthians 27, or 11, 27, whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. So God, help us to take this time to examine ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Highlawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share His Word. And when you love others, you spread the gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you and may God bless you and keep you.